Every Christian is called to be a missionary and take the gospel message to the world that Jesus saves. But that's a big task. It's a task that no one Christian can do alone. That's why God calls us into the community of church in order that we can work together to take the gospel to the nations. Join us today as we look at Matthew 28, the last few verses, those great commission verses, as we ask the question, why, why attend church? Well, when it comes to this lost world, we attend church in order to evangelize the world. Take your Bibles this morning and open with me to the book of Matthew, chapter 28. Very last chapter, very last few verses in Matthew. That's where we'll be today as we finish up this series that we have entitled, Why Church? Why church? Why be at church? Why go to church? What's even the point? Is that even still a relevant thing to do, right? We're looking at this for a couple of reasons. Um... One is probably the idea that we were all separated for, uh, for a couple of years. We went through a couple of years there that were not normal through all the COVID things, right? And the decision is, do, I mean, do we even really need church? I mean, we're streaming all those things. I mean, do we even really need church, right? Do, is it even relevant in, in the day that we live where I can pretty much access anything I want online? So why, why join with a body on Sunday morning and be there together? Dan and I were talking this morning, and he talked about an illustration that I've heard before, but it's perfect for the idea of what we're thinking about with, with church. You know, if you were to take a, a, a charcoal grill, and you were to put all that charcoal on there, and, and, and you know, lighter fluid, and get it going, and, and it ash over, and you've got those, those coals that are hot and ready to put steaks on the grill, right? And you were to take one of those coals, and you were to remove one of those pieces of charcoal from that grill... It doesn't seem to affect the heat of the grill, right? I mean, in truth, the heat that's coming from the grill is less. The heat is not, it's not as effective. You have removed a piece of that coal. But you know what happens to that piece of charcoal that's removed, right? It really affects it very quickly, right? And this is the idea. We are called in Scripture, there's not this idea of this Lone Ranger Christian out there doing it all by themselves. The design and the system that God has put us together is for community, for a community of believers. Could a person sit at home and do nothing but stream messages and be a part of the church? Yes. I mean, in a way they could, I guess. I mean, it's the same way that when I go out of town for several days, right? I mean, I might call Amy and the boys, and I might text her, and I might FaceTime Amy and the boys, we're still married, but it's not quite the same. It's not quite the same. The same idea is true here. Why church? Well, we've looked at it from a couple of different angles, right? And, and, and what we've tried to, the, the, the argument that we have tried to present is that from Scripture it is important and it is relevant because the church is not a lifeless building or just simply an organization, Right? The church is the assembly of God's people. The church is the people, right? And so the idea that we come together as a people, this is important, that we're together with each other for a couple of reasons. We should come together as a church in order to exalt the Lord, in order for corporate worship that the Lord be lifted up and be exalted. And by doing that, we come to church for ourselves in order that we can examine ourselves. When we exalt him in corporate worship and when he is lifted up, then we see ourselves and we see his holiness and our unrighteousness. And we're able to, to draw near to him as a result of that. He's calling us to come to him and, and he's calling us to repent and turn to him. And so we come to examine ourselves. It's important to go to church to edify the body to build each other up. We're here to nourish one another and support one another and help each other grow as we walk with Christ. We looked last week that it's important to come to church to expose false doctrines. We hold each other accountable and we, we become settled in our beliefs because we're not out there in left field doing our own thing. We become settled in what we believe. We know what we believe and we know why we believe it. 
Today, I want to give you the last reason as to why we come to church. Why church? In relation to the lost world around us, we come to church to evangelize the world. The the last reason why we come to church that I'll give you in this sermon series is we come to evangelize the world. Let's read this passage of scripture today in Matthew 28. Extremely familiar verses, 18 through 20. These great commission verses. We want to look at these together, recognizing that the mission he has given us as a church, he's given us as a group. He's given a mission that is too big for one person to do by their self. Therefore, We must be in a community of believers to follow this command. Matthew 28 and verse 18, Jesus came and said to them, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always, even to the end of the age, he says. I have a sneaking suspicion that this is not the first message you have heard from these verses of Scripture. David, why in the world would you preach this again? These verses are pretty important. In fact, the commission, the great commission that we call it, the task of the church to reach the world with the gospel is not only shared here in Matthew 28. This is its first giving, and it's probably the most famous of those that are given. But this great commission is given in Matthew and Mark and Luke and John. And then Luke gives us, to it, gives us another version of it again in Acts 1 and 8 where he says, you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in Judea, in Samaria, and to the other most parts of the world. Scripture hits on this numerous times. Scripture repeats it because this is the task of the church. And we need to be reminded what our task is. You see, this is the real problem, right? We need to know that this is the mission of every believer. And of every church that is meeting this morning, this is the task before us. It's the Great Commission. The the task is to make disciples. Now, when I was little, I thought that the task was to go, right? People would always say, you know, it says go. You go, therefore, and you go. But as I have gotten a little older, the task, if you read that verse, is not to go. The task is to make disciples. Go sounds like a command, but in the original language, it's this passive voice. You've heard pastors say this before, that really it should be probably translated more like, as you go, make disciples. And how do we do that? Well, you do it two ways. Baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. That's the first part. You see them saved and baptized. And you teach them to observe all the things that I have commanded. You disciple them. This is the task of every believer, and it's a super important task. In fact, I really like um, I really like the Liberty commentary on this. The church is not to be merely missionary minded. The church is the vehicle of Christ's mission to the world, and the two, the church and the mission, are inseparable. You cannot tear the two apart. If you have the church, the church must be evangelizing because that is the task of the church. In fact, I might even go so far to say that if a church is not evangelizing, a church might not be the church. Because if a person is not concerned about their lost brothers and sisters, those lost people that live around us, they may not have Jesus in their heart theirself. Because the truth is, is that if you and I believe I believe, as I stand here before you today, I believe that one day we will all stand before him in judgment. And those that have received Christ will spend an eternity in heaven. And those that have rejected him will spend an eternity in hell. And if I believe that, why in the world would I not tell as many people as possible about the truth of Jesus? But I don't. I met a fellow the other day 
shook his hand. I see him all the time. And, and I just, this is, you know, sometimes when you see a person so often, it gets to a point where you've seen them and you say, say hello and you know each other's faces, but I don't know their name. I don't know anything about him. And I just said to him, I see you all the time. Tell me your name, buddy. And we shook hands and he told me his name and we had a short little conversation. And I said something funny and we both laughed and I said, see you later, buddy. And I haven't seen him for a solid week. And when he dies, he'll spend eternity somewhere. Now, I don't know that our first conversation should have been, have you ever thought about accepting Jesus Christ as your personal Savior? But it should have been on my mind. Because the task of the church is to reach this world with the gospel. And the two, the church and the mission, are inseparable. So why in the world would I preach this again? Well, it's because we forget. And we need to be reminded over and over again that our mission as a church is to share the gospel with those that do not know him. So here's what we're going to do. We get verses 18, 19, and 20 together. And as we look at them, I'm going to use four different, um, four different headings to break this down. And I saw someone point out these words, and I've know that, I don't know that I've ever noticed it as I have um, walked through these three verses together, but it's the word all. Do you see how the word all is used quite often in this? And so I'm just going to use those words as the headings as we try to understand and break down this passage. Let's think about what Jesus is saying in terms of all of, all of these alls that he uses. How about that? All right. Let's start with this all. At least in verse 18, Jesus came and said to them, all authority is given to me in heaven and earth. First all he uses is Jesus says that he has all authority. Listen to me a second. Before Jesus gives us a command, Jesus gives us a reminder. And it's really, really important that we understand the reminder because if we don't understand the reminder, then we're not equipped to do the mission that he gives. Jesus' reminder to us is, I have all authority. All authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. If you have a King James, it says the word power. All power has been given to me in heaven and earth. They're not quite the same thing. This is a nuance of words here, right? Power is the ability to do a thing, right? I have the power to do this. It's not what authority is. Authority is the right to use the power. And this is what Jesus has. Not only does he have all power, which we know that him being, him being omnipotent, him being this all-powerful God, that he is able to do whatever he desires, right? But not only is he able to do whatever he desires, he's well within his rights to do it no matter what he does because he is the Lord, and he has the authority to use the power. This is the reminder that he's giving them. This is a very clear proof that Jesus is God, the Son. This is very clear proof that he is deity. If you read Matthew's gospel, Matthew over and over again is trying to show us how Jesus is God's Son and how Jesus has all authority. Matthew talks a lot about the kingdom and presents this idea of Jesus as a king. And in doing so, he's trying to show us that he has all authority. Let me show you some examples of this in Matthew. Look at what Matthew tells us. In Matthew chapter 7, Matthew tells us that Jesus has authority when he taught. Look at these verses. Jesus finished these sayings, and the crowd was astonished at his teaching. Why? He was teaching them as one who had authority, not as their scribes. Now, their scribes had knowledge. Their scribes had understanding. Their scribes may have had wisdom. They may have had an education. But when Jesus taught it was different, the people recognized that it was like they were getting it from the horse's mouth. Jesus had the authority to teach this. Matthew 4 tells us that Jesus had authority when it came to healing. He went out through all Galilee teaching in their synagogues and proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom, he was healing every disease and every affliction among the people. He cast demons out. He healed diseases. In Matthew chapter 8, it tells us that Jesus had authority over nature, that he and his disciples were out on the boat, and it got rough and stormy, 
Jesus said to them, why are you afraid? Oh, you have little faith. And then to the storm, he rose and he rebuked the winds and the sea, and there was a great calm. Jesus had this authority. He had authority that only God has because he forgave sin. In Matthew chapter 9, he says that you may know that the Son of Man, that in order that you may know that I have authority on earth to forgive sins, he said to the paralytic, rise, take up your bed and go. You can't see me forgiving sin, so I'm going to show you by means of healing you, take up your bed and walk, but know that I have the power to, to, to forgive sin. And remember what the Pharisees standing around said? Who has the power to forgive sin but God alone? Jesus is saying, I'm God. He's declaring this. I have all authority. And what's interesting, we looked at this several Wednesday nights ago. In Matthew 10, in verse 1, Jesus takes this authority and he delegates it to his disciples. In Matthew chapter 10, he's going to send his disciples out. Look at what it says in this verse. He called to him his 12 disciples, and then he gave them authority over unclean spirits to cast them out and to heal every disease and every affliction. A couple of Wednesday nights ago when we looked at Matthew 10 together, we talked about how that, how that Jesus was giving them this authority and that these miracles would prove that the words that they were saying was true, Right? We don't need this authority because we have the authority of Scripture. We can go to the Word of God, and you can see whether what I'm preaching is true or not because you can see it in black and white before you. They did not have that. And so as they took this message to Israel that the Messiah had come and that they should repent and turn from their sins, Jesus gave them the ability to do these miracles and perform these miracles so that it would be proof of the authority that they carried with them, an authority that was not their own but authority that had been delegated to them by the one who has all authority. Look at this picture. This is from Daniel 7. This is Daniel looking ahead in time. God gives him this vision of Christ. Look at how Daniel sees the Lord. Daniel 7, he said, I saw in the night visions, and behold, with the clouds of heaven, there came one like a son of man. And he came to the ancient of days and was presented before him. And to him was given dominion and glory and a kingdom that all peoples, nations, and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away. And his kingdom one that shall not be destroyed. Do you see this powerful picture of Jesus? Pair this with what Paul says in Philippians chapter 2. When he describes Jesus... He says, therefore, God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess Jesus is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Do you see what the Bible is showing us? Jesus has all authority. What Jesus is saying in this one sentence that we read in verse 18, all authority given to me in heaven and on earth. That seems like a very common statement until you consider the image of glory that Daniel sees, until you see the miracles in the Gospels, until you consider the words that Jesus taught, until you consider the power that he gave to his disciples to heal diseases, how he multiplied the food and how he calmed the storm and these things that he did that demands that every person confess this is the Lord. This is the Lord. It's evident. It was apparent to so many people. Do you remember what happened after Jesus calmed the storm? What did all the disciples say? <laughs> no one has power like this, and they bow down before him, and they worship him on that boat. Do you remember the, the guard that's standing there at the cross? Surely this one is, right? This is the Son of God. This is, these things that are happening here would not happen if he did not have the authority that he has, Jesus himself and his authority demands that we perk up and listen. And that authority, that reminder of the authority we have is huge. If you and I, we know the mission, all right? Let's just, uh, let's just assume for a moment that we're disciples and we're listening to this. 
We may not know where Jesus is going if he just says verse 18, right? We don't know the command that's about to follow. But sitting here, hindsight, which we have, we're able to see that Jesus is fixing to tell them, you're going to take this gospel to the nations. Now, knowing what you know, what are the practical problems that come with sharing the gospel with the nations? Well, I, I don't know if I can do that, David. I mean, I'm scared. What if they laugh at me? Hmm. We see he's got all authority. So the message that you're sharing is a powerful message, not a message about a dead man who did good things, but about a risen Lord who's on the throne now. And that same risen Lord who's on the throne now, he's commanding you to go and make disciples. Does your fear, should it even factor into the equation? Hmm. But David, I, I, I mean, I could share with them about Jesus and then they could ask me something that I don't know. Yeah, it's not based on what you know or on your power. What is this command based on? His authority. And he has all authority. And by the way, he's commanding you to go. So whether you know or not, or whether you look foolish or not, should that even factor in? Mm -mm. Because the king sitting on the throne is commanding us to go and to make disciples. But David, I just don't want to. It's so much easier just to sit on this pew and not, I want to. But he has all authority and he has commanded us to go and make disciples of all nations because he has all authority, because he is on the throne. This should be a motivator. It should fuel us to go and to tell others and to follow the command that he's about to give. He doesn't start off with the command. He starts off with a reminder that he has all authority. Look at the second all in this passage in verse 19. He said, all authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. Therefore, go therefore and make disciples of all nations. Here's the command. We're to make disciples of all nations. Now notice before we skip over it, Look at the first part of verse 19. It says, if you have a King James, I think it says, therefore, go. But if you have the ESV that I'm reading from, it says, go, therefore. That therefore is connecting the unlimited power of his resources to the vast scope of this command that we're fixing to look at. You take the gospel to all nations. Now, that sounds like a difficult task, right? Right? It sounds rough. I'm supposed to take the gospel to the, to the world? Hmm, yeah. But you have his unlimited resources empowering you as you go. Therefore, go and make disciples. When you look at what he's asking us to do, he is asking us to reach all nations. When you see that word nations, we've already read it a time or two in some of the other verses that we've read this morning. When you hear nations, you don't need to be thinking about countries. You don't need to be thinking about borders and governments. That's not what he's talking about when he says nations. The word there that's used is the word ethnos, where we get our word, where we think about like ethnicities, right? So what he's talking about, the, the word that you'll hear people use in uh, among mission, organization, and groups is we, we're going to talk about people groups. We want to reach people groups. Even within a particular nation, there may be several different people groups. There may be several different cultures or tribes or, uh, you know what I'm talking about, different ethnicities within one. And so we're looking at people groups. When he says that, I want you to take the gospel to every group of people on this planet. I want you to share the word with all of them. And this command to all nations is huge. So I said before, it is not a comfortable command. If you think that your calling as a Christian, if you think I'm preaching this series of messages because our call as a Christian is just to come and come to church, you've missed the boat, right? You can come every Sunday and be here. You can sing in the choir you can give in the offering, you can be involved in various facets of the life of the church and still neglect the mission that he's given us to make disciples. It's easy to do. 
We have not been called to sit on a pew. We've been called to go and make disciples. Dawson Trotman in his book, Born to Reproduce, listen to what he says. The curse of today is that we are too busy. I'm not talking about being busy earning money to buy food. I'm talking about being busy doing Christian things. We have spiritual activity with little productivity. The gospel spread to the known world during the first century without radio, television, or the printing press because the writing of the apostles produced men who were reproducing. But today, we have a lot of pew sitters. People think that if they are faithful in church attendance, put good-sized gifts into the offering plate, and invite people to come, they have done their part. If I were a minister of a church and had deacons or elders to pass the plate and choir members to sing, I would say, thank God for your help. We need you. Praise the Lord for all these extra things you do. But I would keep pressing home the big job. Be fruitful and multiply because all these things are incidental to the supreme task of winning a man or a woman to Jesus Christ and then helping them to go out. See, this mission to all nations, if we're going to reach all nations, that requires activity, right? It requires activity. It requires action. It requires us to do something. In fact, what we're doing this year, the reason that we have 100, uh, you know, all the, all the places where our logo is, when you see that number 100, it is because we're celebrating 100 years in ministry, at Center Grove. Center Grove was established in 1922. But in addition to that, we're considering how we can invite 100 people. If you are on track to do 100 people, you at this point in the year should have asked 22 people to come to church. You you should have 22 people on your list as of today. If if you're on track at par, you'd be at 22 for the year, okay? You might not have 22 on on, on your, you. You might not have asked 22 people but maybe you've asked 10. And the question is, would it have been on your mind and would have you asked those 10 if we weren't talking about it every Sunday? If we weren't saying every Sunday have a Jesus conversation because we're supposed to take the gospel to all nations. And this task is so big, we cannot do it by ourselves. We cannot. I do want to show you from Scripture a few things. It seems like... Um, it seems like all this springing forward has, has taken all my time. But I'm going to tell you in very quickly that one of the things that if we're going to reach all nations, we, we have to do it together. Consider this from the scriptures. When Paul says, remember when he writes to, when he writes to um, the Corinthians and he says, I planted, Apollos watered, God gave the increase. Do you see how this is, Paul is not taking credit for for the Great Commission himself. It is a joint effort. I want to read you a longer passage. I want you to see that our model, that the way that we work together, this is a biblical model. This is in Romans 15, and Paul is writing to the Romans, a church that he has never been to, and he's writing to them about his desire to come to them. But scattered in this passage, there are some hints that this task of missions, this task of taking the gospel to the world is bigger than, it's bigger than one person, it's bigger than one church. Look at what this says in Romans 15. Paul says, I hope to see you in passing as I go to Spain. That was, that was Paul's uh, goal. He never got to Spain, right? He got to Rome. They arrested him and took him to Rome, but he never got to Spain. He said, I hope to see you in passing as I go to Spain. And to be helped on my journey there by you, once I've enjoyed your company for a while. At present, however, I'm going to Jerusalem. Listen to this. Bringing aid to the saints. For Macedonia and Achaia, those are regions. So he's talking about all of the Christians, all of the churches within those regions. Of Macedonia and Achaia have been pleased to make some contribution for the poor among the saints at Jerusalem. They were pleased to do it. And indeed, they owe it to them. For if the Gentiles have come to share in their spiritual blessings, they ought to be of service to them in material blessings. When therefore I have completed this and have delivered them what has been collected, I will leave for Spain by way of you. 
Do you see what's happening here? You not only have people, Paul, Apollos, working together to see the mission come together, you see churches working together. Groups of Christians living in the regions in this early model were giving aid so that Paul could go on a mission trip, essentially, back to Jerusalem, help the poor, give them money, buy food for them, help them, help the poor in Jerusalem, and at the same time say to them, Jesus is Lord. See what I'm getting at? Every Sunday, when we come together for worship, and I direct you to an Annie Armstrong Easter offering, I'm not asking you to give to an offering because I want to line my pockets. You understand that if you were to come here today and you were to put $1 million in the offering, my check next week is going to be exactly the same. It's not going to change. But you know who gets a pretty big, you know, the check that we're going to send to missions is going to be huge. It's going to be huge. Because the way that we have designed that is we set up and with a percentage, we set a percentage of everything we give, we send to the cooperative program. I'm glad to be a Southern Baptist. I, I know that Southern Baptists get a lot of bad press, right? Southern Baptists hate Disney and don't drink or whatever, and everybody don't like them for that or whatever, you know? But being a Southern Baptist is a lot more than that. And this is one of the things that I like about being a Southern Baptist church. We have joined with thousands of other churches and we give to the cooperative program. And as we give to the cooperative program, what we're doing is we are supporting thousands of missionaries around the world that we would be unable to support. If you were just to leave it to Center Grove, we might be able to send a missionary or two or support a portion of one missionary in a place but we cannot do alone what we do together, partnering with other churches, the churches in our association around us, even the Senior Adult Revival that we'll do this week, partnering with our association, partnering with other churches. We are not in competition with the church down the road. We all have the same mission. And the mission is to take the gospel to the nations. And so when we give to the cooperative program, and that money goes to our Georgia Baptist Convention, and then about half of that goes to the Southern Baptist Convention, and they're splitting that between the International Mission Board for International Missions and, 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 and the North American Mission Board for things here at home. We are able to support and do so much more together than we would be able to alone. That model of the cooperative program is what Paul is talking about in Romans 15 with Macedonia and Achaia and the other churches that are giving. That's the model. It's a biblical model. And I'm happy that we give and I'm thankful that you have chosen to give as much as you have chosen to give to the cooperative program that you have chosen over the last decade to double your missions giving or more, right? I'm so thankful for your, your willingness to do that as a church and those that sit on our finance committee and all of that, because it is how we reach the nations. All authority, all nations. I know what time it is. All he commanded. Look at 19. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them. That's the first part. Uh, you didn't have Christians in the New Testament that weren't baptized. A, a baptism was a public declaration that you had followed Jesus. You baptize them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. But look at the second part of the command in verse 20. You teach them to observe all that I have commanded. You understand that once you give and once you go and once you share and a person comes to Christ, the mission's not over. The mission's not over. You know what we looked at last week, the passage we looked at last week in Ephesians 4? What did it describe? It described an immature Christian, an immature Christian. What did that Christian look like? He looked like one who was tossed about to and fro. It, it talked about that he, every wind of doctrine that comes, he hears this thing and he blows this way, and he hears that thing and he blows that way. He's not settled. He's not stable. He's not secure in anything. He's every which direction. Once a person comes to Christ... In some ways, I mean, the Holy Spirit lives and the Holy Spirit can direct and guide them and lead them, all of that. But we have this pattern of thinking that for so long it has not been a Christian biblical worldview. We're not thinking in those terms. And, and even Paul, when you think about how educated Paul was, yet he spent so much time 
preparing and getting ready and being discipled and learning and getting settled in his beliefs. And this is what it takes for a Christian as well. A Christian who comes to know Christ, they must be discipled and led by others. And I'll, I need to be quick, so I'm going to point you to Timothy 2, to 2 Timothy 2.2, 2, and then I'm going to move on. But in 2 Timothy 2.2, 2, Paul writes to Timothy and says, What you have heard from me in the presence of many witnesses, you need to entrust that. You need to give that, share that with faithful men who will be able to teach others also. Not only do we replicate, not only do we like replicate this message of Christ, like I share it with Karen, and Karen's saved, and Karen shares it with Billy, and Billy's saved. So I'm saying, like, there's not only is there this chain reaction when it comes to the gospel, but there is this chain reaction that comes with discipleship, where when one person is matured, they are tasked with maturing someone else. And I'm gonna tell you, this Paul Timothy model, right? I've heard people say this before, and it's a good practice. If you're here today and you are a Christian, you should be a Paul to someone and you should be a Timothy to someone. If you're a Christian, you should be a Paul to someone. There should be someone that that is not as mature in their faith as you that you're looking to and you're trying to pour into them. You're spending time with them because discipleship's an investment of time. It's living together. It's a person seeing you live and walk with Christ and seeing how they can do that in their own life. And so you live together and you spend time together and you invest in that person. That's discipleship and you should be doing that to someone as a Paul to them. But at the same time, none of us have arrived, have we? So we should be a Timothy to someone and we should, we should find out, we should allow to come under someone else's wing. We should have the submit ourselves to that person, kind of humble ourselves and, and learn from that person and see how they can help us grow in our faith. All authority, all nations, all that he commanded. Last verse, all ways. How long is this going to happen? How should we do it? All ways. Notice this, all ways. This always is telling us that he is with us, right? All authority is mine. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations. Baptize them. Teach them what I've commanded you. And remember this, behold... I am with you always to the end of the age. He's with us. This is the very last statement that's made in the book of Matthew. If you were to turn all the way back to Matthew 1, Matthew 1 opens up with a genealogy, right? Most people skip over that when they're reading through the book of Matthew. It's boring. So-and-so begets so-and-so begets so-and-so. And it gets done. And then Gabriel comes to Mary and says, you're going to to bear the Messiah, the Son of God. And you shall call his name Emmanuel, which means God with us. From the first chapter of Matthew, I'm with you. To the last chapter of Matthew, I'm with you. Even in this great commission, there's these bookends here, right? Like the the mission... Go and make disciples, that's stuck in the middle. Make disciples, that's stuck right there in the middle. What is it bookended by? What surrounds that? You can do this mission because you have all of my power accompanying you. I'm going to empower you because all authority is mine in heaven and earth. Therefore, go and make disciples. And don't be scared or worried or frightful along the way because I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Listen, he's with us. He doesn't leave us. This is a truth that you know. But I want you to focus on for a minute, end of the age. That's huge. Do you know what that means? That means that there's a plan. That means that this mission that he's called us to is part of a bigger plan that's bigger than us. Because there will be an end to this age. Now, the Bible tells us about that. You, people that have read the Bible before, know that Jesus came once, died on a cross, rose from that tomb, and is alive today and ascended back to the Father. 
And we are presently, currently living in this church age where he has empowered us with his Holy Spirit and we are to be his witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, the uttermost parts of the world, making disciples of all nations. And this is the church age. And one day this age is going to end because he comes back. He comes back. That's the end of the age. His second coming, the return of Christ. This is this rapture of the church, the return of Christ. This is the end of the age. What we're doing now will end. But the Bible also tells me that what we're doing now will be successful. God's plan is not a plan that's just going to fall through, right? Like God had big hopes to reach the nations. Too bad it didn't work. Too bad we didn't do our part because God's plan failed. Did you know that the Bible is very, very clear that God's plan does not fail? Matthew 24, verse 14, Jesus is describing the end of things. Now, there's lots of prophetic, weird things in Matthew 24 and 25 that are beyond my understanding. But this is pretty plain and simple. Listen to what Jesus says. This gospel of the kingdom, this gospel of salvation, will be proclaimed throughout the whole world as a testimony to all nations. Doesn't that sound super familiar? And then the end will come. Do you know, you know, you know what that verse says? That verse is telling me that before the end comes, the gospel will be taken to every nation. He has commanded us to go and make disciples of all nations. This verse tells me that will happen before the end of the age. You want even better news? Revelation chapter 7 Verse 9 gives us a picture around the throne. Listen to this picture. Listen. After this, John says, I looked and behold, there was a great multitude that no one could number. From every nation. All tri- and, hey, nation, ethnos, people groups. All tribes, peoples, and languages standing before the throne and before the Lamb and they were clothed in white robes with palm branches in their hands, and they were crying out with a loud voice, salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. Do you know what that verse tells me? Not only does the gospel go to every nation and then the end comes, somebody in every nation turns to Christ and is around the throne. This message of his is successful. This plan of his, this mission is accomplished. In the will of God, it is accomplished. This morning, we have a task, and the task is to take the gospel to the nations, baptizing in them and teaching them to observe all things, but we are not left to our own devices. All authority is his, and he is with us the whole time. And because he is on the throne, and because he is worthy of all praise, and because every single person that we know is going to spend eternity somewhere, we must be here for each other in order to reach them. With your heads bowed and your eyes closed, as they come with a hymn of invitation, I'm going to ask you to bow your head and close your eyes. And I'm going to ask you that right now that you would consider this particular message that we have talked about today. You see, we are called as a church to take the gospel to the nations. But that starts not in a deep, dark jungle of Africa. It starts in Rock Springs, Georgia. It starts right here in this place today. You may be here, and you may not know him as Lord and Savior. But whether you acknowledge him to be Savior or not, he is on the throne, and he has all authority. And I believe that this morning, if your relationship with that Lord who is on the throne is not right, I believe he's showing you that right now. I believe his Holy Spirit would impress upon your heart your need for him. I want you to listen to me. I don't normally do this. 
But I want you to consider whether you know him as Lord and Savior today. Is the Lord dealing with your heart? Is there this feeling in your heart that the Lord's giving you that says something's not right? You don't, you don't know me like you should. You don't have a relationship with me. You need to turn to me today. I want you to listen to me very carefully. I'm going to ask you to do something right now. I'm not going to come to you. I'm not going to embarrass you. I'm not going to point you out. But I would like for you to very quickly and quietly raise your hand so that I can see your hand if you feel that way. I'm not going to come to you. I'm not going to point you out. I simply want to pray for you. If you're here this morning and he says to you, you don't know me and you need a relationship with me, would you slip your hand up? Thank you. Thank you. Any others? So I said, I, I'm not going to come to you and I'm not going to point you out, but I am going to do this. In a moment, we're going to stand and we're going to sing and I'm going to invite you to come. The same Holy Spirit that causes us to recognize what we need gives us what we need. And today, if you, if you don't know, if you're unsure as to whether you know him or not, I'm going to invite you in just a moment to come and to kneel on this altar and I want to get someone that can take God's word and just walk through it with you so that you can leave here today knowing that you have peace with him. Maybe you're here today and you know him as Lord and Savior. You're a Christian. You, 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 everything seems to be right between you and your relationship with God, or at least you thought it was when you walked in here. But as we've been sitting here, he's impressed upon you that the mission is not on your mind nearly as often as it needs to be. He's even pointed you to names and faces of people that you know and see that have been a cause of concern as you've sat and listened to this message because you know that he's called you to take the gospel to the nations. If you're a believer here today and he's called, he's caused you to recognize this lack of drive for the commission in your life, would you slip your hand up just quickly and quietly? I see those hands. Thank you. Yes, any others? When we come together, we do not simply come together to hear me say something that you hopefully stay awake through. We come together and I share from God's word that God would show us how we can be right with him and then he calls us to repent and turn to him. And this song that we sing at the end of the service is not just a way to end in a nice, neat fashion. It is a call for response to the word that you've heard. Will you respond? How will you respond? Lord, we do not want to leave here unchanged. How pointless would it be to walk in here one way and to walk out of here the exact same way? What would be the point in us coming, Lord? Work in our lives right now to show us how we can be conformed to the image of your Son through obedience to you. Lord, it is in your name that we pray right now. Amen.